Grandma and Grandpa, Mima and Papa, Gramps and Pop Pop, Nana and Papa, today is Grandparents Day. If it were not for our grandparents, where would some of us be? If it were not for their sacrifices, where would some of us have landed? Will you join me in saying a prayer of blessing today for our grandparents? We bless you for the gifts of love and time and patience. We bless you for the sacrifices you made in the middle age and retirement. We bless you for helping your children raise us, for teaching us your faith, for praying for us when we were lost, for keeping a strong light shining in a world of darkness. We bless God for grandparents. Morning, Judson. The Apostle Paul writes on the importance of knowing what the gospel is. When he writes in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, he says, For what I received, I passed on to you as of first importance, that Christ died according to the scriptures for our sins, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures, and that he appeared to Peter and then to the twelve. After that, he appeared to more than 500 of the brothers at the same time, most of whom are still living, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles, and last of all, he appeared to me also as to one untimely born. I am surrounded on every side Can't see the light of day But I am persuaded beyond all hope You won't let go of me I stake my claim on every word you say You will not be late for I will sing through fire and thunder Cause you are on my side I trust you with my life I know my story, it isn't over Even against all odds You are a faithful God You're a faithful God
the darkest of weather though i can't see i still believe you're good so i'm moving forward through crashing waves i know i'm safe with you hold my life you hear my cry with every breath inside for I will sing through fire and thunder Cause you are on my side I trust you with my life I know my story It isn't over Even against all odds You are a faithful God That's who you are you are a faithful God. I am convinced that your promises will hold together, and I will dwell in the hope of your love forever. I am convinced that your promises will hold together, and I will dwell in your love. Oh, I will sing through fire and thunder Cause you are on my side I trust you with my life I know my story It isn't over Even against all odds You are a faithful God You're a faithful God you are a faithful God. Good morning, Judson. Um, what we're going to do today is we're going to pray together. And it's a response, it's a responsive prayer. And um, as we gather together um, to worship and encourage one another as the body of Christ, um, and for you all at home to just be in a in a spirit of worship, we lift our prayers and hearts to the Father together as a church, remembering our brothers and sisters, not only here, but throughout the whole world as a response to each um, prayer. The response is, Lord, we ask for your wisdom. For the church throughout the world, that she may walk in gentleness and wisdom as she faces trials of various kinds. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, we ask for your wisdom. For our sisters and brothers who are waiting at borders, living in refugee camps, and seeking safety for themselves and their families as they face oppressive situations, may they be filled with peace and faith. Let's pray to the Lord. Lord, we ask for your wisdom. For our sisters and brothers who have experienced loss of family members and property due to fire, hurricane, and flooding, may they find comfort through your church, Lord. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, we ask for your wisdom. For our sisters and brothers who have suffered the effects of this pandemic, loss of family, jobs, and well-being. May they seek your face as their refuge and strength. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, we ask for your wisdom. And for our local church, Judson Church, that you would give us unity of heart, mind, and purpose as we pass through this time of transition, we pray to the Lord. Lord, we ask for your wisdom. Father, we come to you this morning, humbly seeking your wisdom. We thank you for our church family, not only here, but around the world. And we praise you that no matter what is going on around us, you're in control of all things and we can trust you. Guide us, Father, in your way and in your truth and in your life. 
We pray these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. If I were to ask you what you were devoted to, how would you answer? The evidence pretty much speaks for itself. Some people are devoted to their jobs, haven't missed a day in years. Some are devoted to their spouse or kids, and they make great sacrifices for them. Some are devoted to sports, and you can tell it by the clothes they wear and how much time and money they spend on it. Some are devoted to reading or entertainment or having a good time. I am devoted to my family. They are always my top priority, and I will make sure to do everything to make sure they are happy, safe, and healthy. Whatever it is you are devoted to will affect your time, how you spend your money, and what you think about. God wants us to be devoted to the right things. We are to be devoted to Him, and then He tells us how to express our devotion to Him. The book of Psalms says, Teach me your way, Lord. May, that I may rely on your faithfulness. Give me your undivided heart, that I may fear your name. I will praise you, Lord my God, with all my heart. I will glorify your name forever. The dictionary defines devotion like this. To concentrate on a particular pursuit, purpose, or cause. King David said he prayed morning, noon, and night. That's devotion. It's about setting ourselves apart and committing everything to God. May we always put God first in our lives. Through His strength, may we live as people devoted to the gospel and the commands of scripture. And may He be glorified through our actions. Good morning, Judson. We're passing through a time of transition and it's an exciting time. It can be a scary time. Change is always um, a challenge. It is a challenge for good and a challenge um, that can be a little bit difficult at times. Um, when, when I say the word time, time is an interesting thing. In scripture, we have two different kinds of time. One is, is chronological time or time that um, uh, we keep on our watch minute by minute second by second. But there's another type of time that God talks about, and that's the kairos time, or that moment in time, a decisive moment where we are called not only to make a decision about something and to take action, but we're called to encounter something or someone. I want to talk to you today and share with you today about kairos, that time. We start out with just the teaching of Jesus in um, the Gospel of Mark, chapter 1, verses 14 and 15. At the beginning of Jesus' ministry, it says this. It says, now after John was put to, into prison, Jesus came to Galilee preaching the gospel or the good news of the kingdom of God and saying the time or the kairos is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand repent and believe in the gospel. Repent and believe in this good news. Jesus is saying the time has been fulfilled. There's a, that Kairos moment. This is a time of decision. A right decision must be made. A decisive point in life. A divinely appointed time where Jesus said, this is the time. This is the time to make the decision to believe this good news. But in order to do that, we've got to let go of some things. We've got to turn away from the way that we've been living and begin to live a new way into the kingdom. We see Kairos moments throughout the history of scripture, the history of the Bible. We see it in the life of Abraham when he faced, when he, when he met God for the first time. And we see it in the life of Moses, but we see it most clearly in the New Testament, not only in the teaching of Jesus, but in something that happened in Jerusalem 50 days after the resurrection 
of Jesus. And that was called Pentecost. And if you would turn with me in scripture to Acts chapter two, that's where we're gonna begin. Um, I'm using the New King James Version of the Bible. It start, Acts chapter two starts out, the, the disciples have been gathered together in the upper room and they've been praying together and seeking the Lord. Jesus told them um, right before he ascended, like 10 days um, uh, before he ascended, he said, you need to wait. You need to wait for the for the coming of the Holy Spirit. And when the Spirit comes upon you, you're going to be my witnesses. You're going to be changed. You're going to have a kairos moment, a moment of decision. And so they were waiting in the upper room. And we see this in, in Acts chapter 2, verse 1. It says, when the day of Pentecost had fully come, they were all with one accord in one place, that they were together, that they were not only together in the place, but they were together in mind and spirit. They were focused on one thing. They were focused on, on waiting for this coming of the Comforter, the coming of the Spirit. The time of Pentecost, an interesting time because it has really two meanings in Scripture. It's a, it was a celebration where people would come from all over the Roman Empire, gather together. Jerusalem at this time was probably a city of, of 30 to um, 25 to 30,000 people. But during Pentecost, it was a big celebration, a big festival where there could have been upwards of 100 to 200,000 visitors to Jerusalem, coming for a number of different things. One aspect of Pentecost was an agricultural aspect, and that was the beginning of the grain harvest. It was 50 days after Passover or the Feast of Weeks. And so we have people gathering for that, but also there was a historical celebration that was looked at. And this was the giving of the law at Sinai. And people would come for that. And so you had people that were gathered together from all over the Roman Empire, um, not only Hebrews, but, um, but Greek-speaking Jews, and also people who were seeking God, the coming together. You also had people coming to visit their families, just like any time, type of festival where people would come together. It was a great celebration, like our Thanksgiving, where people would come from all over the place to gather together in a family. So Jerusalem was packed full of people during this time. This Pentecost was a lot different than ones in the past because this one was a Kairos moment. We see that at the giving of the law at Sinai, we had all sorts of things that were taking place. There was there was um, the wind and 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 torrential rain, and there was the thunder and the noise of trumpets and all these things that were taking place at um, at. Sinai when Moses was given the law. And we see at this Pentecost, we have similar things that take place. Let me read this. It's just very interesting. It says here, it says, they were gathered in one accord in one place and suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind and it filled the whole house where they were um, sitting and there appeared to them divided tongues of, as of fire as one sat, as this, these tongues of fire sat upon each one of them, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues, as the Spirit gave them utterance. And this is this is like a, a fulfillment of what took place at the giving of the law. But now it was the giving of the Holy Spirit. We see the wind, the wind of the Spirit coming, and the noise, the noise of the rushing wind, but also the 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 vocal proclamation of the glories of God in other languages, the tongues of fire sitting on their head. And, um, and we see this, that not only was this a fulfillment of what took place at Sinai, but it was also a reversal of something else that happened in the Old Testament, which was the story of Babel. Do you remember the story of Babel where um, the people gathered together to build a city and to build a tower up to heaven? And as they were as they were building this, their language was confused, and they scattered to the four winds. They scattered. They couldn't understand each other. They couldn't get along. So they scattered all over the place. And so language was a barrier in Jerusalem, but that barrier was supernaturally overcome as a sign that the nations would be gathered together in Christ now at this Kairos moment at Babel. 
earth proudly try to ascend to heaven, whereas in Jerusalem, heaven humbly descended to earth. Something was taking place. Something was taking place. There was a gift that was given at Pentecost. Two gifts, as a matter of fact. And Peter talks about this not only in his sermons, but at the end of the sermon, I want to read this to you. Um, Because we're going to be focusing more on the end of chapter 2, verses 38 through 47, during this sermon series. And there was a movement that was taking place. And Peter says this. He says, um, starting in verse 36, he goes, Therefore, let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. And now when they heard these things, all the people that were gathered together at this place, and they heard their languages being spoken, and they they heard glory to to God, the the, the, proclamation of of the, um, the wonders of God being spoken in their own language, and they gathered together, they heard Peter preaching about Jesus being Lord. It says they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the, the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? What shall we do? They face this Kairos moment. And Peter says this. He says to them, repent. And let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness or the remission of sins. And you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. In this Pentecost, in this Kairos moment, this moment of decision, Peter was inviting the people that were listening not the ones who had been cut to the heart. He was inviting them, but he was also giving them a challenge, a challenge to turn away from their old way of living and to turn to this new understanding of what God was doing. The same message that Jesus gave in the gospel of Mark, to repent and believe the time's been fulfilled. The kingdom of God is here. The kingdom of God is at hand. The gifts of Pentecost, forgiveness of sin. That was, that was available to the people who would receive it. And also the gift of the Holy Spirit to regenerate, to indwell, to unite, to transform this group of individuals into a new community, into a new family, into the body of Christ. The forgiveness of sin is to wipe out our past, the gift of the Spirit to make us a new people, to repent and be baptized Peter wasn't asking for private and individual conversions only, but also for a public identification, and that's the baptism, a public identification with other believers, sharers of the same spirit, a new people, a new family, a new community. When we talk about Kairos, this moment of decision, the people that we're hearing had this opportunity, they had this invitation to repent and to believe, to become part of this new community and to begin walking in a new way, to be walking in this change, in this transition. But it started with them having to leave their old way of thinking, their opinions, um, their understanding of culture and to take on this new understanding Not something that they could figure out themselves, but the Holy Spirit coming upon them and renewing their minds, renewing um, them as a people, not just as a group of individuals or as a social gathering, but as a, a spiritual entity, a spiritual entity. Um, Acts chapter two, verses 38 through 39, again, repent and be baptized. This was the Kairos moment, the point of decision, the place of decisive action. Now, Peter's message that he preaches in um, in Acts chapter 2, this is called the kerygma or the proclamation, the core of the gospel. The core of the gospel is that Jesus is Lord and Christ, Lord and Messiah. He who was born in our humanity, lived our life, died for our sins, rose from the dead, and ascended into heaven. This Jesus, Lord and Christ, now has sent his spirit to his people to constitute them his body, his corporate expression, and to work 
out in them what he had won for them on the cross and in the resurrection. This is exciting because we, we talk about the, the kerygma, this, this core of the gospel as the, as the, um, Jesus being Lord in Christ, but it was his incarnation. God became man so that we then could share in his life together. So we as the church become his incarnation here. We become his body, his corporate expression. And this is the, um, this is the beauty of the gospel, this new beginning, this new creation. There's a, there's a, um, a snapshot that we see in scripture of what that church looked like. Here's 3,120 people who were now baptized. What are they supposed to do? How are they supposed to live as believers? How are they supposed to live in this new way of living? This sermon series, um, I entitle it The Church on the Way. We are the church on the way. In Spanish, it's Somos Iglesia en Camino. We are the church on the way because this is a church in movement. This is a church that's, that has just begun and is growing and changing and moving with the Spirit of God. I want to read to you this snapshot of what the church um, looked like as they began. And this is in Acts chapter, um, uh, chapter 2, starting in verse 42. And it says, they, those people, those 3,120, they committed steadfastly or did they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, to the fellowship, and the breaking of bread, and in prayer. And fear came upon every soul, and many and many wonders and signs were done through the apostles. And now all who believed were together, or they were in one accord. They are one mind, one purpose. And they had all things in common. And they sold their possessions and goods and divided them among all as anyone had need. And so continuing daily with one accord in one mind, with one purpose in the temple and breaking bread from house to house, they ate their food with gladness and simplicity of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to the church daily those who were being saved. We see the church growing. We see the church living. We see the church moving. We see the church um, receiving and acting decisively in this Kairos moment. They devoted themselves, and that's what it says. They devoted themselves, or they continued steadfastly. This word is so powerful because it, it means to, um, to a, attain oneself to, to give constant attention to. What are you devoted to? What are what are some things in your life? Like right now, think about the things that you're devoted to, the things that you give all your attention to, the things that you continually, you continue steadfastly in. You know, what are those things that you're devoted to? Well, the early church was devoted to the apostles' teaching. They were devoted to um, the fellowship, the breaking of bread, to prayer, for caring for each other, for evangelism. We're going to talk about that in the weeks to come. But more than that, there was a supreme devotion, and that started with encounter with the living God through the power of the Holy Spirit. Anthony Gillis, in a, in a great book of church history called The People of God, says this. He says, the gospel is first and foremost a call to personal transformation in Christ. Jesus wasn't a social worker or just an example. He was a man who showed us that the human person is deeply flawed in its separation from God. He showed us that to overcome that separation, the human person must repent and believe and then grow in awareness of what it means to be saved and redeemed. By the God-man, and more than showing us such things, he accomplished this salvation and redemption. Jesus became for us the way, and so we are the church on the way, but we're also the church of the way, that we're the church of the Lord Jesus. Jesus became for us the way 
of our encounter with God, the means by which not only God became, we become God conscious or we start growing in the Lord, but we become God transformed. Jesus taught us what it meant to be fully human. And through the spirit he sent to his church, he made it possible for us to become fully human. He made it possible for us to become the new person, the new humanity in Christ together, together. St. Francis of Assisi, who wrote back in the 1200, said this, and it's just beautiful. He says, Christ, the gift of the Father's love is the way to him, the truth into which the Holy Spirit leads us, and the life which he has come to give abundantly. When we think of being the church on the way, on the way to, the, to fulfilling the kingdom purposes that God has created us for together, when we think about being the church of the way, that we are the church of the Lord Jesus Christ, that he is our primary devotion, and that everything we do should start with that. We're the church on the way, we are the church of the way. I guess the question for me, for you today, for all of us, is are we the church in the way? And that we could definitely be in the way of God's kingdom movement when we act separately, when we act as um, individualistically, when we don't, um, we don't um, uh, continue steadfastly in the word of God, in the apostles' teaching, in the fellowship, in the breaking of bread and prayer when we're not caring for each other and only thinking about our own needs, we can be the church in the way. During this time of transition for us, for the local expression of the church here on the corner of Infantry and Black Road, Judson Church, okay, we've got, we've got to make this decision. This is our Kairos moment. Are we going to be the church of the way? Are we going to be the church on the way? Or are we going to be the church in the way? And that's our call and our challenge today. I just want to end with this. Um, we experience a close bond with Jesus through the group that he has given us, that he has chosen us to be a part of. In this case, we're in this local expression that we call Judson Church. And we participate in life together with each other. And this is a time for us to really continue steadfastly together. A time of belonging and a time of unity, a time of coming together. And in the weeks to come, we'll, we'll, we will talk about these things, about what it means to be people of the word, what it means to be people of the fellowship, what it means to be people of worship, what it means to be people of prayer. And we're going to talk about that because if we're not doing it together, then we become the church in the way of the movement of the kingdom. I want to pray for us today as we end. I want to pray that, um, that we have a Kairos moment now in this time of transition, that we would really begin to seek an encounter with the Lord Jesus. Many of us years ago had an encounter with the Lord and we were we became followers of Jesus, that we were born from above or born again. But many of us didn't really realize that when we were born from above, that Jesus came into our lives in the power of the Holy Spirit, but he brought his family with him, that we're part of something bigger than ourselves. So it's more than just a personal relationship with Jesus. It's a corporate relationship with him. It's time for us to come to understand that. It's time for us to come to, to own that and to walk in that, to be the church of the way. Um, some of us haven't come to a relationship with Jesus. We have a religion. We have really the law at Sinai, but the Lord's saying, oh no, this is a time for Pentecost. This is a time for an outpouring of the spirit. This is a time that God wants you to have an encounter with him, an encounter that will change your life and change your life um, and give you that abundant life that he promises us. He tells us in John 10, 10, says the thief comes to steal, to kill and to destroy. But I have come that you would have life 
and have it abundantly. And the Lord desires that for you. Jesus said earlier, he goes, the time is fulfilled. This is it. This is the Kairos moment. This is the Kairos moment for you and, and for me. He said, the kingdom of God is here in our midst. It's time to let go of our old concepts, to let go of our opinions, to let go of our selfishness, to let go of our old life and to take on his life, to become the church on the way, the church of the way. It's time to repent and believe this good news that the Lord is making us a people after his own heart. Let's pray together. Father, I pray for um, for our church. I pray for Judson. I pray during this time of transition that you would speak to us, that we, you would give us, Lord, a um, refreshing in the Holy Spirit, that you would pour out your spirit on us. Lord, we know you're here in the midst, but it's us who need to open our hearts to you. It's us who need to be available for an encounter with you. Father, I ask that you would move in power in our midst, that you would unify our hearts and our minds, that we as early disciples would be of one accord, that we would be together um, in our minds, in our hearts, and in our purpose as we move through this time of change, this time of new beginnings. And I thank you for this opportunity. I thank you, Lord, and I bless you in the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Oh, 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 oh,